I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name, and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello, listeners. This is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to another Shakespeare Anyone mini-episode. In these mini-episodes, we'll be exploring topics that are related to Shakespeare but aren't necessarily connected to whatever play we've been discussing. And they're mini because, well, they're shorter than our other episodes. They're like quartos if the regular episodes are folio editions. Today, we will be discussing Shakespeare's soliloquies and asides, moments when characters are speaking to no other character. And we are going to stay away from any sort of acting advice for these moments, or any attempts to dissect a specific speech. That's more than we have time for. Instead, we are going to focus on moments of solo speech, as a whole, and look at the trends and statistics we can find when we look at these moments across all of the complete works. Now, according to Merriam-Webster, a soliloquy is the act of talking to oneself, expressing internal thoughts aloud, either alone or with other people nearby. 
it is specifically used to describe a solo utterance of an actor in a play. It derives from the Latin solus, meaning alone, and loqui, to speak. The word soliloquy and the word monologue exist in a sort of Venn diagram. They cover a lot of the same ground, but there are some differences in their usage. Monologue derives from the Greek manos, meaning alone, and legain, meaning to speak, but can also refer to the scene in which an actor soliloquizes. It can also refer to a dramatic sketch performed by one actor, the routine of a stand-up comic, and a long speech that monopolizes conversation. We want to acknowledge that if you've taken a theater class before, this definition may be different than what you were taught. It doesn't help that each individual academic or theater teacher might have a slightly differing definition of a soliloquy. For example, James Hirsch, in his 2003 book, Shakespeare and the History of Soliloquies, further defines the soliloquy as, quote, any dramatic passage with the following characteristics. One, it is spoken by a single actor, and two, the character portrayed by that actor does not intend the words to be heard by any other character, unquote. Another academic, Alan Richardson, says that if you take Hirsch's definition and add length, that equals a monologue. For our purposes today, we are going to focus on what Marcus Norland calls insides, speeches where a character in a play is speaking mostly to themselves, whether or not another character can hear them. And these speeches are neither choruses, prologues, or epilogues. Choruses, prologues, and epilogues are separate from the main action of the play and do not represent so much of an individual point of view as they serve a narrative function, such as guiding the audience through the play. Nordlin also draws a distinction that other academics do not by distinguishing between a soliloquy, longer passages where a speaker thinks they are alone, and solo asides, which are, quote, spoken in the presence of other characters but guarded from their hearing, and therefore fairly short, unquote. Nordlin notes that his insides can either be a soliloquy or a solo aside, and we will use all three terms today as we look at how Shakespeare uses solo speech. For his 2017 book, The Shakespearean Inside, Nordland combined computer-assisted quantitative analysis and traditional literary scholarship to all soliloquies and solo asides, excluding choruses and epilogues, to establish a database of Shakespearean speeches where the speech is not intended to be heard by any other character on the stage. The resulting Shakespearean Inside database is available online for free for anyone with access to NVivo software. The database allowed Nordland and his team to assign data points to the Shakespearean text such as, quote, locus, the location of the speech, play, act, and subgenre, genus, the speaker's gender and class, and finally, modus, the nature of the speech, unquote, which covers what the character is ultimately doing in the speech, such as planning future events, describing events offstage or other characters, or reflecting on a theme. One of the goals of this study was to see if, quote, a combination of qualitative and quantitative analysis can uncover patterns that a human interpreter could not easily detect by just reading or watching the plays, that even Shakespeare himself might not have been aware of, unquote. This data analysis of Shakespeare's complete works allows us to examine Shakespeare's soliloquies and asides and look for patterns that exist across all of Shakespeare's works, across genres, and that can give us a greater insight into certain characters. First, it is interesting to note that the distribution of Shakespearean insides by act looks like an M for three out of four of his genres. The comedies, tragedies, and romances see an increased frequency of solo speech in Act 2, with a decrease in Act 3, then another bump in Act 4. In contrast, the histories tend to wait until Act 5 for the majority, if not all, of their soliloquies and asides. The histories, more than any other subgenre, often need to set up a future installment of their series. Indeed, a closer look at the Henriads shows a reduction in Act 5 insides as they progress from their first installment to their last, quote, presumably because of a dwindling need for social cliffhangers as the story draws to a close, unquote. The comedies, in contrast, see the greatest decrease in solo speech in their fifth act. 
On average, the comedies see only 8% of their soliloquies placed in Act 5, compared to the 18% of other genres. In fact, almost all of the six plays that have zero insides in the fifth act are comedies. As You Like It, Love's Labor's Lost, Twelfth Night, Measure for Measure, and All's Well That Ends Well. The six plays Edward III, and Shakespeare almost certainly did not write that Act 5. Where histories need to set up the next installment in their series, comedies need Act 5 to restore whatever social cohesion has been disrupted over the course of the play, which requires a higher need for dialogue and the revealing of secrets. The data analysis done by Nordland also allows us to learn about the figures of speech and techniques that Shakespeare employed most in his soliloquies and asides. We can also see where Shakespeare deviated from his collaborators on co-written plays, and how his use of certain figures of speech varied throughout his career. Shakespeare's favorite figure of speech is known as apostrophe. Apostrophe is speech that is not directed to an onstage character who can be expected to hear what is said. One-fifth, or 20%, of all of the insides in the complete plays is apostrophe. Compared to his collaborators, Shakespeare, quote, always uses more apostrophe in his insides than do his colleagues. On average, he writes more than twice as much, unquote. Indeed, Nordland argues that apostrophe is a Shakespearean trademark. The most frequent type of apostrophe is addressing an offstage character, which makes up more than half of all of the uses of apostrophe in asides. Timon of Athens uses apostrophe in over half of all of its insides, making it the most apostrophe-heavy play. In Act 4, Scene 1, Timon launches into a barrage of apostrophes, addressing the city of Athens from its walls to its citizens, virtues, vices, diseases, and finally, its gods. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the Comedy of Errors contains zero uses of apostrophe. Instead, over half of the insides in the Comedy of Errors can be categorized as reporting, the second most frequently used form of speech in Shakespeare's insides. In fact, the Comedy of Errors contains more than double the mean amount of reporting for all Shakespearean insides. Reporting can be further broken down into reported words, where characters, quote, import the actual statements of onstage or offstage characters as direct quotations or indirect paraphrases into their own private speech, unquote, versus reported actions, relaying events that have occurred offstage. The next most commonly used figure of speech by Shakespeare is prosopopoeia, the act of pretending to be someone or something else. This was a commonly used figure of speech in the early modern era, and Shakespeare likely would have been taught how to write in this style in grammar school. According to Colin Burroughs' Shakespeare and Classical Antiquity, early modern grammar schools often had students write speeches as specific characters in specific circumstances. For example, students may have had to write speeches as if they were Helen of Troy or Queen Hecuba after the sack of Troy. We can see an example of prosopopoeia in Henry IV, Part I, Act II, Scene IV, where Prince Hal satirizes Hotspur's valor and imagines a conversation between Hotspur and Lady Percy. Statistically less common are Shakespeare's uses of rhetorical speech. Rhetorical speech can be further parsed out as erotema, the rhetorical question, Eliism, talking about oneself in the third person, and twoism, talking to oneself in the second person. Shakespeare used all three more frequently in his early career, then his usage tapers off and disappears completely by the end of his career. When used, rhetorical speech is heavily tied to class. Aristocratic characters, for example, quote, speak 36% of Shakespeare's insides, but deliver more than half of his illistic and twoistic passages. Unquote. Commoners who speak 14% of total insides see a much smaller occurrence of illism and twoism, and gentry predictably fall in between aristocrats and commoners. Rhetorical speech is also inflected by gender, with the men of Shakespeare's canon being twice as likely to talk to or about themselves as the women and the setting of the plays. The Roman plays contain more than seven times as much iliism as other dramas which John Vells argues means that Shakespeare saw Iliism as a very Roman phenomenon. Shakespeare employs these figures of speech in soliloquies and asides to create or muffle audience empathy and sympathy. However, we do not always see a positive correlation between a character's amount of insides and audience empathy or sympathy for a character. In other words, 
Just because Iago tells us his plans constantly in Othello, that doesn't mean that we take on his interests as our own, or that we take on his perspective and experience what he experiences. The soliloquies and asides in The Taming of the Shrew also do not serve to create audience empathy and sympathy. Instead, they are, quote, an extreme example of the early Shakespeare's tendency to use soliloquies and solo asides as expository devices, unquote. 62% of the insides in The Taming of the Shrew are spent explaining what characters are about to do, and notably, Shrew is one of the 11 plays with zero female insides. This means that we never get to hear Katarina's point of view on the events of the play and how they affect her. Despite the lack of female insides in 11 plays, the ratio of insides for women compared to men over the complete works is statistically close to the overall ratio of total lines for women compared to men. In stark contrast to The Taming of the Shrew is Two Noble Kinsmen, where 75% of the insides are spoken by women, with 50% of all insides attributed to the jailer's daughter, a commoner. Interestingly, in the plot of that play, quote, human sympathy is actively foregrounded rather than excised, unquote. All's Well That Ends Well is the only other play where women speak the majority of the insides, 58%. Interestingly, All's Well That Ends Well has important similarities to Shrew. Its male protagonist, Bertram, like Katarina, never speaks a single inside. Both characters are to be married against their wishes, and their prospective spouses make use of a cruel prank to rein them in. Both plays also end with these characters declaring, quote, how happy they are to have been brought into the marital fold, unquote. And both of these plays are typically characterized by scholars as being uncomfortably problematic. While All's Well That Ends Well and Taming of the Shrew lack insides for specific protagonists while others have plenty of solo speech, the plays Richard II and Coriolanus are unique in their overall lack of soliloquies and private speech for the entire play. In Richard II, the king does not deliver a single soliloquy or solo aside until Act 5, Scene 5, which accounts for 91% of the play's total insides. The remaining 9% come from Salisbury's soliloquy about the king's imminent fall. Coriolanus has only one inside and one ambiguous speech. It is unclear if that speech is truly private speech. Despite the issues caused by a lack of solo speech in the problematic comedies the Taming of the Shrew, and All's Well That Ends Well, an overall lack of soliloquy for a character in other genres can tell us just as much about the character as a well-timed soliloquy. Like Bertram and Katerina, the characters of Richard, Lear, and Cleopatra also have no soliloquies. The speeches they do deliver are in the immediate presence of other characters. As we previously mentioned, class does factor into Shakespeare's distribution of solo speech. Royal characters have a smaller portion of the complete insides compared to the aristocracy and gentry, roughly splitting the difference between gentry and commoners. Therefore, the lack of soliloquies for Richard, Lear, and Cleopatra may have something to do with their royal status. However, not all Shakespearean kings and queens lack soliloquies. Another common trait these three insideless characters share is an extreme lack of self-restraint. As characters, they struggle or are unable to navigate the boundary between self and the world. They are unable to guard their speech or even determine when they should. Coriolanus also has a boundary issue. However, he has to put too much of a gap between his own self and the social world, and therefore does not know how to navigate the boundaries of the social world. Lear, Cleopatra, and Richard are not able to tell the difference between their sense of self and the world while Coriolanus finds the world foreign to his sense of self. Now, we said we wouldn't go into analyzing specific solo speeches of the characters who have them, so we will leave this episode here. And that's Shakespeare's language framework, soliloquies and asides. Thank you for listening to this episode. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. 
You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare Any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Julius Caesar, Act 1, Scene 3, said by Casca. Are you not moved when all the sway of the earth shakes like a thing unfirm?